The Children of the Light, affectionately referred to as the White Cloaks all across the Westlands, are one of the antagonists of the Wheel of Time series, and also an antagonist which seems to be very believable, at least in our modern world. The White Cloaks are a military group of zealots who believe their interpretation of the following of the light is the only interpretation, and they will bully and murder innocents who disagree with them. Now, while they appear to be an allusion to the Knights Templar in their appearance, they also share features with groups like the KKK or other hate groups. What is absolutely true for the Children of the Light is what great antagonists they make in the series, and they're a group within the Wheel of Time story that has a very distinct arc, which makes them great to examine. Today, we'll be adding to my cultural examination series for the first time in a while. We'll be breaking down everything there is to know about the Children of the Light. How they came to be, how powerful they actually are, and of course, what happens to them after the story. So let's take a look at the Children of the Light. My cultural examination videos are broken down into 10 sections to really dive deep. As a refresher, those sections are history, demographics, geography, economy, government and law, military, overall power, significant landmarks, significance to the story, and what happens after the books. The first eight sections of this video are gonna carry a spoiler rating of yellow with no major spoilers of any kind, but I will be talking historically and about details of the world building. If you want absolutely nothing spoiled for you, you may wanna come back when you finish the books, but there are not gonna be any plot spoilers at all in these sections. When we get to the last two sections, I'll throw up another spoiler warning as we'll be getting in to some full spoiler content at that point. So the history of the Children of the Light starts more than 1,000 years prior to the start of the story. In free year 994, after ruling the entire continent of the Westlands for more than 30 years, Arter Hawkwing dies without any heirs. Now this is probably a video of its own, so if you want me to make a video on Arter Hawkwing's rise and fall, let me know in the comments of the video. But without any heirs, his massive empire fractures with various former provinces and generals vying to take control of his vast empire. Now this begins a period known as the Hundred Years' War, where all of these factions fought against each other and new kingdoms were formed. Now during this fighting, a man named Lothair Mantelar comes to believe that all of the fighting only helps the shadow and that the fighting allowed dark friends to flourish. He believed that leading a humble life dedicated to the light was the proper path that everyone should strive towards in life. He also believed that touching the true source was something that only the creator should be allowed to do, and that men and women channeling the power had only ever brought death and destruction, asserting that those that wield the one power were more tempted than most to become servants of the Dark One. He recorded his thoughts in a manifesto called the Way of the Light. He then founded an order that he called the Children of the Light, in the free year 1021, almost 25 years into the Hundred Years' War. And despite his controversial views, he gained a following and that order grew. Now in the early days of the Children of the Light, they were traveling preachers that used the way of the light as scripture with which they would proselytize their views on the war-torn areas and people who were desperate for an end to the violence. Now they would also use their words to try and expose dark friends within the communities that they entered. Because they spent their time though in war-torn areas, as time progressed, the Children of the Light were forced to learn to defend themselves if they wished to continue with their mandate. So around free year 1111, they became a military organization as well as a preaching group, dedicating their military power and political abilities to exposing those that they thought were dark friends, including Aes Sedai. Now at some point in this period, the assertion that the One Power was a temptation that could lead to following the Shadow morphed into the assertion that all who touched the One Power were dark friends, setting the Children of the Light completely against the Aes Sedai. Now, the Children of the Light did not have a home location, but they traveled in groups around the known world, preaching and using violence to enforce their viewpoints, as they were tolerated at least. Now, roughly 400 years after the founding of the Children, in the year 306 of the New Age, the White Cloaks were able to shoot the Amarlin seat, Serenia Latar, with arrows and ambush her party as she was mediating a dispute in Altara. After her death, 
they hanged her body and made many believe that they had hanged her alive. Now, this was considered their most important accomplishment against the power of the Aes Sedai, but aside from small victories like this, they were never really able to gain much power. Their power and prestige were limited to small groups that believed their message, and they never had any real political power. They were only able to operate in areas where the governments were weak and were unable to fight them off. The Aes Sedai maintained massive amounts of power in the Westlands, and the children were unable to establish a power base because of this. This is how the Children of the Light continued for roughly the first 1,000 years of their existence. Until the 930s of the New Age, they reached an agreement with the King of Amadisia, who allowed them to establish a permanent base in the city of Amador. However, once they established their base of operations in the Fortress of the Light, their influence in Amadisia began to expand and the military nature of the forces outstripped the king of Amadisia. The Children of the Light became basically de facto rulers of the nation, and although the king of Amadisia and his army remained, they were subsidiary to the Lord Commander of the Children of the Light. In 957 of the New Age, the Children of the Light, with their power base in Amadisia secured, and with a young and incredibly intelligent military commander named Pedro Nile at their head, invaded the neighboring kingdom of Altara and attempted to annex most of its northern areas. This conflict became known as the White Cloak War and involved not only what forces Altara could muster, but also the military forces of Murundi and Ilion. After gaining much territory, the children were eventually pushed back into Amadisia, but they never really truly stopped trying to expand their influence. Members of the Children of the Light are largely residents of Amadisia, although there are a significant number of children who have roots in other nations. The Children of the Light are remarkably accepting of others if your ideology perfectly matches theirs. Because of this, they have many different nationalities represented in their numbers, so there is no set way that they are described to look. Now, in terms of population centers, it becomes very difficult to distinguish what is the nation of Amadisia and what are the Children of the Light. But as the Children of the Light are simply a military organization that operates out of Amadisia, it would not be right to attribute the entire population of cities like Amador to being part of the Children. It is fair to say that the citizens of Amadisia seem largely okay with the existence of the Children, and their status as the de facto rulers. The nation of Amadisia appears to be a largely successful nation that sits at the crossroads of other nations, and because of this, it does have some trading advantages for those that wish to deal with their stringent rules. The Children of the Light again primarily reside in Amadisia, but they are not a nation in of themselves. However, for the sake of this breakdown, we'll focus on the geography of Amadisia, as that is where the children, for the most part, reside. Now, Amadisia sits at the very southern edge of the Mountains of Mist, at the intersection area between Altara, Tarabon, Murundi, and Gildan. There are major trade routes that run right through the nation. So there are a number of major cities in Amadisia, all of which have large garrisons of the Children of the Light. The most prominent of these cities is Amador, which is the capital. This is the location of the Fortress of the Light, which is the main headquarters for the entire order. Other major cities in Amadisia are Abila, Jeremel, and Sienda. One of the major borders for Amadisia is the River Eldar, which is a large river that originates in Ebudar. It's not as large as the other two major rivers of the Westlands, which are the River Arenon and the River Arenel, but it is a major waterway and it services the kingdoms of Altara, Amadisia, and Gildan, and it serves as a major transportation system or sort of like the highway. Before taking root in Amadisia, the children were likely supported by wealthy donors and individuals who volunteered to be a part of their ranks. Because they do not individually strive to be wealthy, they likely gave up their own wealth when joining the organization, so this is likely supplementing their income as an organization. One thing is for sure, though. The White Cloaks are always very well supplied and provisioned when they're encountered in the books. Money does not ever seem to be an issue for them and they do field a large standing army that would be very expensive to maintain unless they were well financed. The Children of the Light are governed by the Council of the Anointed, which is a body that serves as the ruling council for the children. The council sits to set the policy for the entire organization. The council is presided over by the Lord Captain Commander of the Children of the Light, 
The Lord Captain Commander serves as the supreme head for the organization. He rules not only the military aspects of the children, which we'll talk more about here in a moment, but he also serves as the chief diplomat and political face for the organization. The laws of the children are largely based upon the way of the light and its historical interpretations. They root out dark friends, but there appears to be a very loose interpretation of what constitutes a dark friend. At times, they seem to be set on proving their own preconceived notions of who is and who is not a dark friend. For example, all Aes Sedai are dark friends and are typically met with disdain and hatred, and they try to kill them. One thing is for certain, anyone that is thought to be a dark friend is given a sham trial and executed once they are confirmed to be guilty. A section of the children called the Hand of the Light, but also known as the Questioners, set about using questioning techniques, which are really just torture, to force those that are accused to confess to what they have been accused of. Considering the Children of the Light are at their core a military organization, this is an important topic in this discussion. Their military structure pretty much follows their governing structure as well. At the top of the organization is the Lord Captain Commander, followed by a Lord Captain, which represents a legion of roughly 2,000 men. Other levels of leadership under a Lord Captain are Senior Lieutenant, Lieutenant, and Under Lieutenant. Additionally, there is a semi-military organization within the Children of the Light that I previously mentioned called the Hand of the Light. Now, while these are not full-time soldiers, they do have a military capacity, and they serve as questioners of Dark Friends. They are ruled over by a High Inquisitor who serves directly under the Lord Captain Commander. There is also a Spy Master and an expanded spy network that informs the leadership of the Children of the Light. While it's unclear how many of the children there are in the series, it can be assumed based on some of the numbers of their armies that we do hear about that their number is somewhere between 20 and 30,000. They are remarkably well equipped they, with burnished armor and swords, and they all have horses. They're well provisioned as well, and they appear to be well trained, although they may not have actually seen much actual battle. They're just good at bullying those that can't fight back. Which leads us to talk about the overall power. The Children of the Light fall in a strange place when it comes to power in the Westlands. On one hand, they are very powerful in the sense that they essentially control an entire nation, and they seem to be able to go into other areas and harass population centers. On the other hand, they can't really expand outside of their borders, and they're met with disdain in many places. Additionally, their numbers would not really let them challenge the armies of some of the larger nations, which would field more than five times their number. The main power of the Children of the Light actually comes from the overall distrust of the Aes Sedai. Their message has some merit to some of the more downtrodden and looked down upon areas and people, and so they do meet some welcome when they go to various areas. They are looked at as a counter to Aes Sedai power, even if that isn't entirely valid, and so the political will has not existed to just completely eliminate them and their power base. They have very little political power, but they are also very difficult to get rid of because of their military and the fact that it would take a nation to go all out the war with them to really stop them. There's just enough of them that it's really hard to do that. Now, in terms of landmarks, they, again, are not a nation, and so therefore they do not have landmarks under their rule. The closest thing of this would be the Fortress of the Light, which is a large castle complex in Amador that serves as their base of operations and capital. Inside the Fortress of the Light sits the Dome of Truth, which is where the Council of the Anointed often meets. It also serves as an audience hall for the Lord Captain Commander, and this is where Dark Friends are made to stand trial. Inside the Dome of Truth is a fresco of the hanging corpse of Serenia Latar, the Amelin that was executed by the children. They really like that moment. The building itself is very impressive, both in size and beauty. It's about 100 paces wide, and it rises 50 paces high at its peak. The dome is gilded, and the floor is white marble. In addition to the fresco of the hanging Amerlin, there are other frescoes depicting victories of the Children of the Light, but who knows if they're actual victories or not. Now, before moving on to the spoiler content, let me thank the video sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is a massive online learning community that allows you to basically learn anything from the comfort of your own home. As a part of my real job, I coach executives and individuals on how to grow and develop leadership skills, as well as the ability to grow in other areas of their lives. Ongoing learning is a major piece of making sure that you're able to take advantage of opportunities when they present themselves to you. Skillshare is a really great and very cost-effective way for you to keep learning skills and small tidbits. 
You can learn to cook. You can learn to use video editing software, learn how to code, learn how to do 3D graphic animations. All of that through Skillshare for one super, super low monthly fee. Like, it's really an amazing deal for what you can get out. If you click the link in the description of this video, Skillshare is going to give you a free trial so you can check it out. I've been a big user of Skillshare to get better at what I do here, and I highly encourage all of you to check it out. And of course, you help support the channel by doing so. Now, let's get back to the video, but first, new spoiler warning. The rest of this video will carry a spoiler rating of red, with major spoilers all the way through the end of the books. Watch the rest of this at your own risk if you have not finished The Wheel of Time. So the White Cloaks play a small but significant role in the main storyline, specifically in the plot lines of Perrin Ibarra. They start off the series as essentially bullies that Perrin ends up killing two of them when they attack the wolves and threaten him and Egwene. There are some signs of good in them at the Battle of Falma when they engage the Shan Chan and charge alongside Perrin, but for the most part, their role in the beginning of the story is as an antagonist and as bigoted zealots. Galad Damadred eventually joins their number, and although he is not as awful as some of the others, he seems to have very flawed thinking for joining their ranks. They play a large role in the Morghese storyline, and when Aemon Valda kills Pedro Nial, he does some pretty awful things to Morghese, and this is the impetus for Galad to kill Valda after the Shanchan attack and the takeover of Amadicia. And then eventually Galad becomes the Lord Captain Commander. Galad's arc in the story actually mirrors somewhat the arc for the White Cloaks, and through Galad's leadership, they begin to see past viewing things as black and white, and they understand that their assumptions are not always correct. By the end of the story, the White Cloaks as an organization are fighting along the Ashaman and Aes Sedai, and although they're still prejudiced, they are on their way to a rebrand of sorts. They do assist in the victory of the forces of the light, and they are sworn to follow Paranabara as well. So what happens after the books? At the end of the last battle, the White Cloaks are badly decimated. Galad survives as Lord Captain Commander, and is sworn to follow Paranabara. Without Amadicia as their home, as that's currently ruled by the Shanchan, the White Cloaks likely relocated to the Two Rivers and changed their views completely on who Dark Friends are. Also, with the complete defeat of the Forces of the Shadow and the Dark One resealed, new Dark Friends are probably fewer and fewer in number. I would guess their focus actually gradually changes to serving and living a simple life rather than running around and bullying people over time. I don't see Perrin putting up with a whole lot of bullying. So what do you all think? Let me know in the comments of the video. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release more Wheel of Time lore content, as well as other news on the TV show. Also, make sure to check out the Monday Night Live shows, now called the Dark Friends Social. Those happen every Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Special thank you to all of my patrons for your support. This would not be possible without you. If you want to become a patron and support the channel, click the link in the description of the video and consider supporting the channel. Thanks to all of you who are up on the screen right now. Also, make sure to check out one of these videos here that you may like. Thank you for watching, and until next time, peace out.